Hi everybody, welcome back to our CXO series in collaboration with NYSE Wired. You're watching theCUBE, I'm Dave Vellante. Really pleased to have Doug Gourlay here, the newly minted CEO of Cumulo. Doug, great to see you in our studio here at NYSE. This is awesome, right? It's fabulous being here. I like the energy, uh, the fact that, you know, seeing open AI and everything going on here, it's a great day. Yeah, Thanks Oracle rang the bell today. Uh, Sunny Singh's coming They've in They've never later. done that before, have they? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Oracle's smoking. Oh, um, killing it. As your former firm, wow. Uh, but tell me, why Cumulo? Why did you choose this company? Really simple, Dave. If you look at the amount of data that's being generated today, it's unparalleled how much is being created, both by generative AI, as well as phones, surveillance systems, cameras. It's more data is being generated now and will be generated in the next three years than has been created in the history of humanity. And if you look at that, you go, wait, it's being generated and it has to be retained. You combine that, the amount of data is exceeding Moore's Law's ability to absorb it, which means I have to build new data centers, go to hosting facilities, or go to the cloud, or some combination of the three. And what Cumulo was uniquely positioned to do was create a cloud data platform that worked in the public cloud, the hybrid cloud, and the private cloud, allowing customers' data to be effectively managed wherever it's located. And that was a very unique value proposition that looking at the needs of AI to consume data really spoke to a tremendous opportunity. It's true, in fact, we coined this term super cloud. It was sort of tongue in cheek. Yeah, no, you're but right we on. meant going beyond multi cloud, so you have a consistent experience across cloud. We always yes. use Cumulo as an early example of super cloud. Now many have. You sort can't of, say meta cloud for other reasons. Yeah, right? yeah. it's just a little too obvious. But that's, yeah, that's right. But some people do use that term meta cloud. Okay, so the fundamentals are great. In fact, we're blowing away Moore's law. I mean, if you just look at what's happening inside of these Apple machines, it's. You know, let's say Moore's Law is 40% a year. This, we're talking about well over 100% a year in terms of uh, performance yes. improvements. Now with AI and what Jensen's doing, we're talking 1,000x in eight, in eight years versus 100x in 10 years. So those fundamentals are good. Um, it demands unstructured data, the primary vehicle for fueling, learning, training, inference, tuning workloads. Okay, I got to ask you. So ever since I've been in this business, unstructured data has been 80% of the, the data. It's got to be 99.9% .9 of the data by It's today. probably north of 90. Right. And, you know, right. I, do, I don't want to like give a hard right. statistic on it because your mileage may vary, yeah. but absolutely. But there's no question unstructured data is growing faster than transaction data, yeah. and there's much more of it, and video has changed the game. Right. We look at your phone, and as you pointed out, 2007 didn't do video. First iPhone that started doing video was like VGA, 640 by 480. Today I've got 4K HDR stereoscopic so I can play it on my Apple virtual headset, which I love playing with. Like the amount of data that can be generated off one cell phone is orders of magnitude more than could be done even five years before. Mm. And then we save it forever. If you look at video surveillance data alone, you're looking at data where the retention requirements are sometimes aligned with the statute of limitations Back. on prosecutorial conduct. It's like, do I want to throw away the data that could exonerate somebody? Or throw away the data that could prosecute somebody? or do I need to save that for a very long time? And that's what starts creating even more impetus and more data that's out there. There's a further fueling AI systems, image recognition systems, video recognition systems, just a tremendous amount of content. Now, am I right this is your first CEO stint? Yes. So what did you learn from Jay Shree that you want to bring to Cumulo, and what, what, do you, what, what fingerprints do you want to put on Cumulo that are maybe unique to Doug Gourlay? It's funny, uh, working for Jay Shree was one of the greatest experiences of my I'll life. Bet. Um, yeah. Her energy level, her passion, uh, her ability to spot an emerging market trend and redirect abject amount of resources to focus on it was unparalleled. And when I look at us as a company, that energy level, that focus on the customer is something that was always very natural to me, but now seeing myself in this seat, there are days I would look at myself in the mirror and go, oh my God, am I really here? What am I doing? And I, as much as I sometimes don't admit it, there are multiple times a day I say, what would Jay Shree do? And what does it come down to? Client conversations, being aware of the market, building a tremendous network of technology peers. These are all things she's done that were amazing and helped catapult Arista into the stratosphere. And being able to learn from that uh, firsthanded and then take that and apply it. Um, I'm already seeing results in my own organization from applying some of these 
basic blocking and tackling things that she did that were so valuable when applied into a new company. Culture's an interesting thing for Huge. a CEO, right? And, and when you first, when you're a kid, you hear culture, like, you think, it may, maybe it's touchy feeling. Yogurt, but, what are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's really, a, to begin to understand how, how critical it is. How would you describe the current culture? I mean, a lot of times culture is just there, it's bubbling, and it just needs to be molded. And, and your customer first um, inclination is, is interesting and obviously effective these days. But, but how do you see it at Cumulo? Is it there? Is it bubbling and you're shaping it? Or was it already there? Or is it a big pivot? How do you see that? There were some parts of the organization that were incredible. The focus on customer success, mm -hmm. the foundational quality in the product, the fact that the company has over a thousand customers in production today, not in, with, with no customer concentration, it is life sciences and healthcare. It is media and entertainment. You can't find a movie or TV show or animated character made in the last five to 10 years that doesn't run on, in existence stored on Cumulo in some way, shape or form, whether through a VFX shop or primary production facility. We have customers today that so we are storing on Cumulo the cure for cancer. Now we need to find it within our data. And another one say, we're generating 750 terabytes a week of data that in it is the cure for ALS and other degenerative neural diseases. Now we have to build the models to unpack it and figure out what protein interactions or neuron interactions are causing this. And I'm like, the level of responsibility you have for data preservation in that environment, unparalleled. The closeness you get to the customer's workflow and use case, not correct. Mm -hmm. And so you take that and have a company with a foundation of customers, huge customers, customer success, high quality. What an incredible foundation. Yet there's some areas to improve, always. Where it's things like the training and education of our go-to-market organization, the narrowing of the focus into the use cases where we have the strongest competitive advantage and differentiation, the evolution of our technology stack to maintain pace with the market changes that require that, both in performance, but also features and capabilities, and expanding that cloud-native portfolio to the broadest cloud-native storage portfolio in the industry today. So if you think about the, the storage business, and it's changed quite dramatically, when you had mainframes, then you had EMC, became the sort of dominant model, and EMC and NetApp were the two sort of independent companies, and then you had some guys that tried to escape, um, you know, get to, es get to escape velocity, not many three par kind of got there and then got acquired yeah. and Isilon and you know on and on and compellent et cetera et cetera et cetera and then you had pure came out and you know, held doing, up pretty do, well doing pretty well yeah. so you got like that we like independent companies obviously EMC's now been absorbed storage companies have evolved from boxes essentially to stewards of data that are software companies it's that's a different business it's different marginal we have economics. No how do you see it? Yeah. We have no hardware. Right. We have a run anywhere model. We run on, we are in production today on Dell. Mm -hmm. We're in production on HP. We're in production on Cisco. We're in production on Supermicro. We're in production on Aero. We're in production on Fujitsu and Arnie. This gives our customers unprecedented freedom of choice. By the way, we're in production on Amazon, Azure, and Google as well. Mm -hmm. So when we say run anywhere, it's run anywhere. Same software, same management, any environment. That solves supply chain issues. It allows better unit economics. It allows you to deal with vagaries of market, uh, commodity pricing changes, in a much more uh, flexible manner for our clientele. Now, the other thing it means is that our clients don't have to go recertify our net new appliance every time we rev a NIC or rev a software version or hardware version. Oftentimes, we're running on the same hardware platform, same Linux version, with the exact same tooling the customers already tested and qualified. So the same software lifecycle management, same image management, same vulnerability management, same CMDB, same ITSM, all of that consistent massively buys down the customer's time to getting us into production and time to value. And in today's environment, like in life, the only resource we have we can never get more of is time. If you have a two year life cycle on that GPU, from the time it ships to the time it's obsolete and the next one comes out, do you want to waste a year of it, testing and qualifying and building the infrastructure, or do you want to be in production in a month? You're maximizing that time to value, maximizing that two-year sprint you have to gain that competitive advantage and crush your competition. So in my experience, um, what you're saying is a good idea, right? The singular experience across any estate, cloud, on-prem, any cloud, <clears throat> et cetera. 
A lot of people are doing that now. A lot of people think, oh, I can do that. And you know what it's like in tech. Um, oh, that's easy to do. And then you start doing it. And it always like, looks oh, easy from a distance, well, doesn't it? This doesn't really work. And there's, there's this thing <laughs> called recovery and, you know, on and on and on. Oh, and so, integration and all the systems it, it, you have to be part of. To be compliant. Partnerships take, yes. a, to take a lot of effort. So is that, my question is, is what is your sort of differentiation from the cartel and the upstarts? Is it that experience that you have and that singular cross the state you know, platform, um, what, what do you see as your differentiators? Four core things, Dave. The first is, uh, believe strongly, we're the only organization with a true run anywhere model. And that is not just in the cloud, it's x86 and it's R. Then cloud native. We are bringing the same unit economics as the on-premises environment, which is the most competitive unit economics, to the cloud. Our customers are seeing almost identical TCO in the cloud versus on-prem, especially when you factor network infrastructure, power, facilities, depreciation schedules, staffing, very complex in one environment, very turnkey yeah. in the other. Mm -hmm. right. Then we have the global mm -hmm. layer space implementation, building a global data fabric to connect the data that's spread all around the world. Simple example, one of our customers, a large research facility, seven research centers, 350 petabytes of data, two data centers, three cloud providers, and now a new AI processing facility in Texas. How do they get the data from the research facilities and the clouds? We're talking hundreds of petabytes and get all of that to the AI processing facility, do its job, and then bring that data back. Building this global data fabric to connect all of those, incredibly powerful. Or think of it in media and entertainment, right here in the studio. How do you have a follow the sun edit suite where I start off editing in London, and then New York, and Vancouver and LA, finish up in Hong Kong, then Mumbai, and rinse and repeat. Can we have a single file stored in one master version that is modified by 10 different developers concurrently as it moves around the sun, or as we move around the sun? Absolutely. So it's it's not a copy model. Copy no. here, copy there, copy there. Single instance, the lock based replica, strictly consistent, so no data is lost and no one overwrites or steps on each other. So this is interesting because, I hope, don't hate me for saying no. this, but, but they call Cupido son of Isilon. But what, what was brilliant about Isilon is they were able to do that, but within a data center. Right, they weren't able to do that across a global within, namespace. Now we're doing it within a planet. And, and that was the interesting thing about Cumulo when we first saw it, we said, okay, this is, you know, Uber. This is super cloud kind of approach. Yes. Um, so, what do you want to do with the company? You want to be here listed someday, who, or who doesn't want <laughs> to be here? <laughs> Rang the bell once. I would love to do it again, Dave. Yeah, awesome. Doug Gorlite, thanks so much for coming on Dave the Valente, Cube. Thank you for having really me. Really great to have you. All right, keep it right there for our next guest. This is the Cube at NYSE with NYSE Wired. I'm Dave Vellante. We'll be right back right after this short break. <laughs>